One of my favorite reminiscences of my teaching career thus far <laughs> has been of a graduate student in a course in literary theory that I was doing. It was on literary theory of the last half of the 20th century and included people like Foucault and Derrida and Lacan. He's the one who said, je préfère d'être obscure. That's the way the French talk sometimes. Right? I prefer to be obscure, and he certainly made it. In any case, she came to me at the end of one hour and said, this is now on, I think. In any case, she came to me at the end of the hour one day and said, Professor Williams, do you mind if I bring my eight-year-old daughter with me to class next day? She'll be quiet, but the babysitter's given out, and if I don't bring her, I won't be able to come. And so I said, well, of course, bring her. She came, and she was an absolutely lovely child. I bade her welcome, and she went with a coloring book to the back of the room. During the hour, she colored, but she'd stop in her color and go, <laughs> look at me like, <laughs> all right? I didn't know what she was drawing, but in any case, she was lovely. At the end of the hour, she came up. I bade her she should come again. She had the opportunity, and they went away. Next day, her mother came, just bent over with laughter. She said, may I tell you something, Mr. Williams? I said, well, of course. And she said, well, my daughter is usually a chattery child. Talk, 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 talk. After your class, she was silent for five miles. Didn't <laughs> say a word. And finally, she said, Mommy. Yes, dear. That Mr. Williams, is he bright? <laughs> the mother said, well, I don't know, dear. He's, he's a professor at the University of Michigan. And he said to know 15 languages. And said her daughter was quiet for five more miles. <laughs> Mommy. Yes, dear. Which one was he speaking today? <laughs> Out of the mouth of very babes, O oh Lord, comes wisdom. <laughs> in any case, it's a joy to be with you. And what I'd like to do in the time allotted is to speak with you of the importance in Western culture of the tradition of the Oresteia. For in our heritage from Greece, Aeschylus Oresteia, which is behind what you're doing, is widely considered to be one of the two great legacies of Greek culture to us. The Parthenon, which we have only in ruins, and the Oresteia of Aeschylus. It is magnificent. Yeah? And it has been with us, as we will see, especially at our times of cultural agony. Yeah? The work as you have it now, the Paul Claudel and Mio work was was done against the backdrop of the First World War with the huge crash in confidence in Western culture and the agony of trench warfare, the, the degradation of it, and the search for what it is in our culture that drives us, what it is perhaps in our nature that drives us to such apparent madness. And the question, is there no way out of this, is deep. There are more versions of the Oresteia story. One version done in 1943, which some of you may have seen, one form or another, Jean-Paul Sartre's Les Mouches, The Flies, which is the Electra story. If this is the Oreste story, writ large, is, is the Electra and Orestes story, if you will. So again and again, this story visits us at, at times of anguish, or we visit it with the question of why in our minds. And I don't need to urge that you keep in mind our own cultural agonies over the last decade with the question of why, why, and are we ever going to find our way out of this? And so it was with particular joy that I heard that the University 
Choral Union, University Musical Society, had taken up this vast and difficult work to present to us now. I take it as an act of very considerable courage, <laughs> for I was reading <clears throat> in one of the earlier accounts of the work, which said that the, the choir is required to screech, howl, and otherwise make dreadful noises in the, in the course of what they do, as, as well as to make beautiful sounds as the choral union usually does. <laughs> and you are working with the French text, yay? Which is a challenge in itself. And I've looked over the translations which you have, and they are challenges in themselves. And, and since the parts of Aeschylus, which Paul, in the version that Claudel gave to us, used by Mio, don't give the whole text. That is, Mio does not set the whole text. Then there are blank spots there that I'd like to help you fill in. Right? Because in understanding those, you will understand something of the project on, on which we are embarked and to whose fruition I look forward so much. And the first thing I, I think we need to do is to discuss a little the story behind the story. The story of the cosmos as a whole, as it was given in the work the Theogony, the birth of the gods of Hesiod. And what you need to know is that in relationship to, but rather different in its emphasis from the Genesis story, what came first to be was chaos. And then Earth, Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A, Gaia, G-A-I-A. Female, and then Eros, who makes weak the knees of gods and mortals. <laughs> now notice, this is a story of origins from the female. And the female, in this case, parthenogenetically, driven by Eros, for Eros is there in the cosmos, in the very cosmic forces, from the beginning. It's, it's not something gone wrong in us humans alone. It is a, a, a force to be dealt with in the cosmos. Okay. She parthenogenically creates sky, male, uranus, female primacy. Okay. And then driven by arrows, uranus, and Gaia lie with one another. Sky comes down at night and lies with her, and they begin to produce offspring. Right. The offspring in this case we need to watch is a figure called Kronos, transliterated K-R-O-N-O-S. This isn't time, C-H-R-O-N-O-S. Right. A lot of mistaking on that. This is Kronos. But once born, a god comes to puberty. Forgive me, I'm Canadian, and I get embarrassed to talk about these things, but, but no, they don't tell us about sex till we're 50, and, and, and then they tell us it's too late already. So I sort of face the wall and talk to you from there. But the gods do come to puberty, and they're going to want sex. And the young are going to want power. You will have seen complaints in, in the humanities, particularly on the part of the Furies, about the younger generation of the gods wanting power, wanting to overthrow the old rites. Right? And in any case, Kronos does come to the puberty of the gods, and he wants sex and power. And where is he going to get it? The only place to get it is from his dad. All right? And so what does he do? Right? Well, Dad soon realizes he's under threat. And he wants to suppress the children, i.e. kill them, if it were possible to kill a god. Suppress them. Watch out for this. 
the mother is angry at the threat to her children. Angry at the threat to the results of her fertility. Are you following? Are you starting to hear Clytemnestra? You should be, okay? And she says to the children, and watch this, this is quite different from the Genesis story. Your father first thought of doing evil. Your dad's the problem. <laughs> and so she arranges that <clears throat> one night, Kronos, when Zeus comes down, or when Uranus comes down, rather, to make love, should castrate the father, hide in the bushes, and when dad comes down, sorry, there it is, and he does, and he takes, the, there are problems in every family, and he takes, the, and he takes the genitals and throws them over his shoulder into the sea, and from the foam on the sea is formed Aphrodite, the goddess of love, so that at the source of desire is a mixture of desire and worrisome force, violence. Do you, do you follow? Right there at the beginning of it, with which we need to deal, which we have to manage. And I've heard that that's true even in the United States to, to the present day, that deep down psychologically, these two things are, are nearby one another. Are you following? And, and we have to deal with them. It's just the nature of the cosmos. Now, Kronos now has all the power and sex that's going around. And he generates children, right? And one of them is Zeus, right? And his mother knows what is going to happen to Zeus, so she hides him away, right? And I won't go into all of the details, but then Zeus comes to power, right? And then Zeus realizes there's a pattern here. Right? I'm next up to bat. What shall we do? And here, again, the emphasis on the female. And the female is cunning this time. As other times, his mother consults with him and says, look, there are now a proliferation of forces, a proliferation of gods. You can't hold out against all of them. You can't have it all for yourself. So you need to set up a system a political system, if you will, of rights and privileges. You give others some rights, some privileges. You keep most for yourself. And by the way, you keep, watch out for this, you'll see it again in the humanities, you keep the thunderbolt. I'll call it the persuader. <laughs> and if there is a coalition against which you need to use it, you can use it. But the cosmos, the, the world will have relative peace. Here is the point, and I want to emphasize this so very strongly, for it in many ways is the message of the Oresteia. Peace, such as we have it, concord, such as we have it, is not given us at the beginning. In the very nature of the whole cosmos are forces in tension with one another. In the very nature of us are forces in tension with one another. And we cannot solve that tension. It is simply there, but we can manage it better or worse. Is this making sense to you? We can, if we will, try to keep it from coming to violence, which is going to involve pain, 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 Death. Now notice, it is in the third generation of the gods that this is achieved. In short, I can't emphasize it too strongly. On the level of the whole cosmos, right? such concord as we have in a system in tension, which is constantly threatening to break down into disorder, that must be a political achievement, a social achievement in giving rights and privileges to others, in compromising one's own position. Is this making sense to you? Are, are you following? 
If we're to avoid, if at the cosmic level, there's to be avoiding a, a lapse into a disaster. Now, now comes the question. How is this going to happen with us humans? And in the, uh, the choice for Aeschylus, who fought against the Persians, one time lost, one time won. He was there at Marathon, according to the story. There was a question, how, how are we Athenians to, to rule ourselves? How are we to adjudicate differences? Because there is this old, old story about us, that we are dynamic systems, if you will, in search of fulfillment of our drives for sex and food and power, and we will not be stopped excepting by the power of someone else. And now you notice what's set up. And here we are with Aeschylus. Right? For what you have is a cycle of revenge in which someone grows in power to maturity, is then the one who tries to exercise all the power, and at that point will be striking others to suppress them, but there will come along someone, some ones who will exert revenge when they are vulnerable at some point. Are, are you following? So the whole of our history, ours, is constantly threatening to lapse into a cycle of revenge. Right? And look, I don't need to tell you about, about this. Most of you were alive in 2001, right? Revenge! All right. We hit, we get hit, we hit, we get hit, we hit. And if you've been watching this text closely, right? It involved deeply are two things. One, to bring back into the story the constituent struggle, male-female. What is the power balance there? And the danger already inherent in the story in Hesiod that somehow the male thrust in him toward violence is toward war, the female thrust toward violence is at its most intense when her children are threatened or killed. Do you, do, do you follow? Margaret Mead, know the name, the anthropologist, remarked that it was darn lucky that men <coughs> were the ones to do the war because they would sometimes have mercy. If women were at war and their children were threatened, there was no end to the violence they'd do. You, you, no, I, I'm not, I'm a Canadian, I, what do I know about these things? But, but, but there you are, you, you follow the, a sort of insight into the, into the sources of, of violence. We could go on about that, but I, but I shan't just now. Right? So the issue of the cycle of violence and the question of how we might emerge from it. Because, you see, if violence is done, and here is the phrase, against someone in your bloodline, right, there arises within you a rage, right, a rage to pay that back, which doesn't have built into it in you any limitation. Some of you will have read Genesis at one time or another, right? The version of it there is of, of a man by the name of Lamech who says to his two wives, Adam and Zilla, listen to me, right? I've killed a young man for striking me, a young man for hurting me. If Cain's going to be avenged sevenfold, Lamech shall be avenged seventy-sevenfold. Do, do you follow? Not only do we hit back, we fight for we break up the peace. You follow. You follow. And so the danger with it is that huge cycle of violence, and then the struggle within that associated with male-female relations. How is that to be worked out? What kind of harmony can be achieved there? And then the children. It's the kids, isn't it? And in the story of the house of Atreus, which has already had, I'd love to go into the story with you, better not, 
from the time of Tantalus to Pelops to Agamemnon, the story of Agamemnon. Right? In the house of Atreus, we are in, in your story, the third generation of violence. And it's violence against children and, and cannibalism. That's, that's the image reality of it. The devouring of children, giving, giving other people's children, right in the family, to be devoured. Do, do, do you follow me? Just kill. Now look, I shouldn't, but I will. You know, I want to be clear, right? In the religions of the family of Abraham, we're family, right? Everybody's family within that, right? And we're killing off one another's children. We are, you know. And we don't stop to say, why are we killing off one another's kids? Do you, do you follow what I mean? Right? That's the depth of, of, of the issues involved in, in the Oresteia. And then, memory. Right? And there is passed down generation after generation. So we're talking about gender and generations now. These images of violence. Some of you have lived nearly as long as me, maybe, right? I don't know about you, but there are images from my own life. I just tense up like that when they cross my mind. Do, do, do you follow? How to pull on them? Any of you remember the photograph of that little girl at Eli naked, running down, having the day bombed? Anybody remember that? Just, ah, you want to cry out? Okay. The young woman at Kent State, you remember, down over the body? Yeah, these images rise, rise, rise in you. And here, the central image in the Agamemnon is the image of Iphigenia. Ares, the god of war, money changer of dead bodies. You send away men that you know. And what comes home? Ashes. Body bags, we call them. Right? And it rouses fury in the society. And as we're at killing one another's young people, what goes back to the mothers? What goes back to the fathers if they're left alive? The money changer of dead bodies, war, body bags, burns with ashes. Are, are you following? And what happens is this anger, anger, anger rising in the society. Be careful whose children you kill. It will come back. It will. It will. It will. Right? And Orestes goes and works himself up at his version of the image of the wall with the dad's name on it, with the grave, calling on the father, if you will. And then he goes. And his mother, his mother, after he, uh, Augustus is killed, Orestes goes to kill her. And the servant says, the dead are killing the living. She's smart. I got the riddle. Bring me a man killing axe, she says. She knows what she's doing. It's interesting that an axe is, is one word here, but man killing axe. She is one angry woman, right? and she's going to kill her own son. She can't. He's armed. And so she bears a breast and says, are you going to kill the mother who gave you a son? You know she's lying, because the nurse has just said a few, hundred li uh, a few lines before that she received the child right from the womb of Clytemnestra and nursed it herself, brought it out. <laughs> So it's all deception. Clytemnestra's name means deception, if you will. There are people who get formed like that, people who are like that. And Orestes slits her throat. And then he says, and I virtually cry, I do this not without justice. And the chorus is spoken of here is violence against violence. Here is justice against justice. Well, look, here is the problem, good folks, isn't it? Right? There's justice on both sides. 
Right? Do, do, do you follow what I mean? Yeah? Is there the right of a father to stay alive? Yes. Is there the right of a mother not to have her children? Yes. Is there the right of a son to avenge his father? Well, yes, they thought so. Is there the right of a mother to not to be killed? Well, yeah. do, you, do you follow? Our issues are not so much when things are very clear, this is good and this is bad. Our issues are that we have to sort our way through a net, if you will. There it is again, isn't it? A net of values. And we try to make our way through it. And how do we do it? How do we do it? In any case, I do this not without justice and then the furies, okay? the arenas, pursue him. And please heaven, there's no one who knows the depths of it here, but one knows it in small ways. Okay? I suspect that in your mind there is something which haunts you still, okay? which is there with you, something personal, something cultural, which is deep in your psyche. And even though you are, every one of you, and I believe it to be so marvelously good people, you're hounded by something. And how do you get rid of it? Where do you put it? What, what do you do with that? With that sense of a combination of anger and guilt? Are, are you following me? Yeah, nay. I'm not going to ask you know, questions about it, but do you follow what I mean? And, and Orestes, who does this not without justice, is pursued, pursued, pursued by guilt over having done what he has done to his mother, though commanded by the God and the culture and, the, and his own anger to do it, he's done it. And the God, now hang on to this, the God gives him purification, but the God himself cannot take away the punishment which he should have. We have, a, have had, for a long time, a version of this in our own culture. I'll refer back to Shakespeare's time because that will make it easy. When someone was being executed, they were allowed a priest. I think one still is a clergyman, isn't one? I, I, yeah, in this country? Yeah? With the notion that you, they can purify the soul, but they still have to pay the civil penalty, which is to die. Well, the form of it here is that Orestes must still die. And the arenas are the embodied fury built up by violence on women right? and their children, but women particularly. It's against the mother killing. Right? But this long history, making sense, yeah, nay. And he is pursued by that, and there seems no way he can go not to, but He's instructed to, and he does. He goes to Athens. And I wonder what story you'd write about the importance of this country in, in cultural development. For Aeschylus, what he is doing is writing the great poem of love to Athens as the place where this problem is worked out as much as it can be. And that's the humanities, right? And when he is in Athens grasping onto the image of Athena, the Furies pursue him, Clytemnestra incites them on to meet him in Athens. They go and there he is. And then there begins a debate. And the Furies say, he did it! And they ask him, did you do it? He says, yes. That's enough. Tell him. Pursue him. Haunt him. You see, it only takes the deed. Remember that word, if you will. It only takes the deed. They did that! Kill them! Right? And Athena says in one of the great phrases, it's there on your sheet, you'll recognize all these as you read along after, after our talk. Here are two parties. The Arenas claiming the right to vengeance and Orestes asking for a trial. And you, Arenes, here are two parties, but only half the argument, 
at the Lord. But what is to be said on behalf of him? And the Uranus said, it's enough that he did the deed. And the king says, no, that's only half the story. Because we want to consider, we need to consider why he did the deed. What forced him on? Do you, do you follow? We have in our own concept of law, do we not? A notion of diminished responsibility. Anybody ever hear that phrase? Yeah. And so the deed, if you will, is not the act. The deed is killing. The act is not necessarily unjustifiable homicide. Is that making sense to you? Is that fun? Yay? Yeah. Now note, here there is a good deal of argumentation between the two sides about gender and so on, problematic stuff, love to talk with you about it. Yeah. <laughs> But the result is that the jury is what we would call a hung jury. There is no way that you can put aside the rightness of the claim of the Furies to their revenge. It's there in the constitution of things. Does that make any sense? Okay? Yeah? Yeah. It's also the case that you can plead, we need to stop this, and his is a case of diminished responsibility. And Athena says, look, what I'm going to do is set up a law court of people in the society, it's called the Areopagus, whole line of works derived the name from this, Milton's Areopagitica and so on. And, right? We're going to set up a law court of people of the city. The case will not be decided in terms of the ethic of personal revenge, we'll do a civic solution, a social solution. Is that making sense to you? Yeah, nay. So that the whole society deciding, there will not be the impulse on the part of any individual to take individual revenge for something that has been done to someone in the family. Is that making sense to you? We will set up a system, a court system, to deal with capital cases. And we, as a society, will accept that. And that is the achievement which is celebrated here. An achievement which is intended to allow us to come out of what seems a hopeless cycle of fury-inspired revenge and through rational discussion of the nature and extent of responsibility, where both sides are heard, come to what can be seen as an equitable solution. And it is announced, it is made here by the vote of a man-woman, Athena, who was born of her father's thigh and embodies both the male and the female. Is that making sense? So there's an attempt to bring into Athens a sort of sexual politics in which the nature and demands of the male and the female will profoundly be respected as well. The challenge that this presents, and I'll stop now. <laughs> the challenge for our own culture as you sing this through, is to try to understand what we are going to do in our own society to deal with these forces which are always there. The solution is not to kill off, not to suppress, not to exclude anger, fury at wrong done. The goal is to channel that into responsible, rational mediation. Don't borrow fear from your city. Have respect for the laws and have fear for the laws. But solve it through rational discussion of dispassionate parties who are not themselves of the bloodline 
of those injured. Is that making, is it, are, are you with me in that? And it's for this reason, among a thousand others, that I celebrate your taking up this task now at our own very difficult and violent time and try to celebrate a solution which is other than mutual annihilation and the pronouncement after every deed of violence, it's finished now, when we haven't even addressed the issues. Well, I must pause. Jerry, I've gone five minutes over my brief time. There, where are you? There you are. I apologize to you. I thank you for your time.